All right, like Jeff said, all kinds of things going on. If you have your Bibles today, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 as we talk about living by giving. You know, we've been talking these last weeks about the resurrection, about our new bodies, about heaven and what that's kind of going to be like, the eternal state. And, and I mean, last uh, couple of weeks ago, you know, death, it says here in verse uh, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. And then Paul quotes the Old Testament saying, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Kind of mocking death almost. I mean, the greatest enemy ever known to humanity is death itself. And the apostle Paul says, you don't need to fear it anymore. I mean, that's, that's an amazing truth, you know, and you're going to go to heaven and you, they're going to get a new body and, and, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And, and you can get so excited about all that stuff that you can kind of go like, great, I'm just going to kind of kick back and chill until all that stuff happens, you know, or I'm just going to kind of hang on and survive this tough life of mine until Jesus, you know, does what he says he's going to do, either come back or I die and go to be with him and, and hang on. And, and so the question is, is that what God has for you? Just to kind of hang on, kick back, wait until all these cool things happen. Or is there more? Is there more? Look what it says in verse 57 of chapter 15. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. Here's the application of all this cool stuff that we've been talking about regarding the resurrection and all the things that are going to happen. God has something for us to do that we're not done yet, that God, in fact, wants us to be people who are, who are solid, man. We're steadfast, we're immovable. But not just that we're solid, but that we're abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the work in the Lord is not vain toil. But so many other things that we do in our lives is. God wants you to be engaged at a deeper level. You know, when I came to Christ, I... Uh, a couple of things happened for me. Number one, first of all, the thing that I noticed the most is that God gave me a love for people. And, and it, was just a, it was just different than before. It's like I came back after my sophomore year, going to Hume Lake, committed my life to Christ, came back onto campus as a junior. And I like to tell people, I almost feel like I was living my life in black and white before, and all of a sudden it just became color, you know? And I got to see everything differently, and it was the most important thing, at least that I recognized, was that I cared about people that I didn't care about before, frankly, or even saw people I didn't see before. And then the next thing I was thinking about is, well, gosh, you know, I wish I could do something for the Lord, you know, I mean, and, and, and that was my earnest desire, that I want to do something for God, you know, in that sense. And then these voices started hitting me, and that was like, well, who do you think you are? I mean, what do you have to offer? And then you start looking around at other people that are really gifted, you know, and you start going, well, they're so much more gifted than me that, you know, I mean, and, and, and then all these negative thoughts. And, you know, here's the thing that's so sad is that some of you have had the similar kind of experience where you started off with some good intentions and, you know, some good desires, but you've listened to the lies. And to be honest, you're kind of sidelined. You know, you're just kind of kind of going through life, and you're, you know, yeah, you're, you're engaged at a, at, a, at a low level, maybe, and, you know, here you're here at church, and thank you for coming. I'm glad you're here. That's an important step. But the fact of the matter is that there's more that God has for us, and I just want to challenge you just to be reminded again that you and I, all of us, we all have three things that God's blessed us with. I call it the three T's just because it's easy to remember, our treasure, our time, and our talent. And so when we begin today, I want to talk about giving your treasure, okay? Look at chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches in Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. And when I arrive, whomever you shall appoint, I shall send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, I, uh, they will go with me. So we begin looking at this concept of 
giving of our resources financially, and it begins with planning. It begins with planning concerning the collection of the saints as I've directed the churches in Galatia. Paul was teaching all of the churches a similar principle, and that is in our giving, it needs to be planned and it needs to be deliberate. I like to say it this way. We need to have a target. We need to have a strategy. And so many times people's giving is impulsive and it's emotional. And so they tend to give rather than planning and deliberate in a strategic way, it tends to be a little bit more impulsive when they quote our they feel like giving or the spirit leads if you're a Christian and you're used to Christian ease. You know, a lot of people, oh, well, in the spirit leads, you know, that's when I give. And I, and I give to needs when I just feel a real impulse from the Lord that I should give and those kinds of things. But sadly, people who give impulsively and who give emotionally tend to not, number one, give very much over a long period of time. And number two, tend to have very little impact ultimately in the way in which we give. And so we want to challenge you to say this, that your giving should be planned, it should be deliberate, and I think strategic, so that your investments do matter. In terms of kingdom investments, I, I even like to talk about return on investment. I like to talk about in eternal, eternal return on investment. You know, the fact is, is that God has an agenda for the world that he says that, that he's going to come back and that he's going to come back after the gospel has preached to all the nations and that we are partnering with God in what he's doing, reaching the nations. So sp- from a strategic standpoint, you know, I think there's some good, uh, some good uh, argument and rationale for being very strategic in our, in our actual giving and, and deliberate. And he said, he said, put aside and save. Now, this collection, now when we talk about the church in Jerusalem, it's kind of important to understand the situation in Jerusalem. Now, remember that Jerusalem, okay, was under Roman rule. So they were allowed as Jews to exist as a religious organization group in Jerusalem with some degree of autonomy under Roman Empire as long as in Roman rule, as long as they paid their taxes and those other things that were important to Rome. They were an oppressed people as, as Romans, and they hated it. I mean, as Roman citizens, the Jews were oppressed people, and they hated it. Now, imagine for a moment that you were to be a Jew who believed that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Messiah. Imagine what it would have been like for you as a Christian now, under the Roman Empire, under the Jewish domination in the city, trying to exist as a Christian. They were the most outcast of all people, which, by the way, is parallel today in the Middle East. We don't hear about it much here in the United States, but the the, the persecution and oppression of Christians in the Middle East is at almost a historic high, if not a historic high. For example, we, we have a family that's, that's got a lot of ties to Egypt. They're, they're, some of their family members are still there in Egypt. The Christian population in Egypt has gone from well over 200, uh, or 2 million P- Christians now, and it's probably under half a million, and some say as, 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 it could be as low as 250,000. From, from just a few short years ago, 2 million, that they have been so so persecuted and so oppressed. You go to Lebanon, you see what's going on there. You go into the Middle East, and I mean, not, not to mention Iraq and Syria and, and Iran and those places where the, uh, there's overt persecution and martyrdom that's taken place for many as well. This is the situation that these, Jew, these Jewish converts to Christianity were experiencing. Not only that oppression, add to that the drought that they were experiencing at this time as well. Now, we're in California. We understand about the drought. But the truth is we haven't faced the consequences of the drought like you would think, like you would in ancient times. My my question is, why haven't we? Well, our water practices are different. We have the ability to actually pump water from the earth. You know, not just a few wells that you can bring up hand wells and stuff that, but actually pump water from underground aquifers, which allows us to stay viable. If you're in Southern California, the system's, you know, from the Colorado River. Man, if it wasn't for the Colorado River, L.A. would not exist, man. It's just the way it is. We live in a day when even with the drought, we can sustain ourselves for a period of time. They did not have that same ability back then. So when you're an agrarian culture like they were, and you don't have the, the, the rain that they need, man, it was, it was brutal. So they had drought and oppression. They were in desperate circumstance. And so the Apostle Paul, everywhere he went, he told them about the birthplace of Christianity. 
Jerusalem. And what's, what's amazing is Jesus said to those, he says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and the ends, you know, and, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth, right? Remember that when Jesus said that? Here we have the ends of the earth ministering to the church in Jerusalem. That's how it works in God's economy. As we take the gospel to the ends of the earth, the ends of the earth become a blessing to us. It just, it just works that way. So that's the situation. These churches needed support. This was a missions kind of giving, similar to what we would call our Go Fund. And uh, Paul was taking a collection specifically over and above the regular collections they took for the church um, for, this, for this need. The principles, okay? Who? Who's supposed to give? He says, each one of you none of the believers were exempt people are to give all of us are to give we're all stewards of God it's not simply based on perceived need God commands us to give it's an act of obedience on our part the reason that God has always instructed his people to give is because it is the only antidote to the selfishness that is so much a part of our human condition and when we give to others and when we give to our church and other places like that it is an antidote to the selfishness that's so much a part of our lives and that's why the bible always teaches to give from the first and not the last we tend to give when we're immature from our leftovers what's left over god says i want you to give from the first because the fact of the matter is if we wait till we can afford to give we tend to never give sacrificial giving honors god it means something to God. It means something to us when we do so, when we give from the first and not the last. Now, you know, we as a church have gone through uh, a number of, of financial campaigns for, for buildings, for example, for the expansion of our facilities. When we first came here, Gail and I, now 34 years ago, November 1st, uh, we actually came 34 years ago, we, we, we had that one building right there. And we started to soon outgrow that. And so we built this worship center here which has served us well for many years. We had a financial campaign to do that. As a lead pastor, leading the campaign, uh, you know, uh, we gave, Gail and I and our family gave sacrificially and significantly to do that. Then we did a remodel of the other facilities. That was building campaign number two. Building campaign number three was the educational building in the back. Building campaign number four, which we conceived of in 2004, 2005, was the student center. And this was a really big one because we had to buy property. The Williams had a piece of property right there, a little house that was sitting there. So we had to buy that, tear that down, tear down all the Christian school facilities, okay, that were there, the, the single-story buildings, that one of which now remains, and then, you know, do all of the excavation that we needed to do, erect the building there, do the, the courtyard there. It was a huge project. Little did we know that the economy was going to tank like the day we started the project, you know, so it was one of those kind of things. But here's the thing is that each time we, we made the financial commitment and God honored it and as a family, personally, Gail and I, and, and but when we came down to the student center one, I got to admit, man, it was like whew, we've been through three. You know, it's it, our you know our daughter you know is is in college. We've got two more kids that are going to go to college. We think our daughter will probably get married at some point, and our other kids are going to get married. And sure enough, she met Ryan, and yes, they were getting married. In the midst of all of this, three kids in college during this time of giving, three weddings, you know, coming, all the other kinds of stuff that are coming. And we looked at each other and just said, man, how are we going to do all this? And by faith, we just trusted God and said, okay. And so we made a really significant pledge on our budget, based on our budget, that we said, okay, God, unless you show up, it's not going to happen. And here's the crazy thing for us. We made that pledge that week. My aunt, I have a, a rich aunt and uncle. They are very rich. And, uh, and, and uh, they have never given me anything. But I'm not bitter. Um, that, that, <laughs> that's okay. Um, and so my rich aunt calls and says, Hey, Tom, she says, uh, Uncle Roy, you know, Roy brought, brought me a new car. And she says, uh, and my kids, she has two, I have two cousins. My kids don't want my old car. It only has 74,000 miles on it. Would you like it? Well, it happened to be a Lexus with 74,000 miles. It was the proverbial little old lady from Los Altos Hills, you know, not Pasadena. Some of you will remember the little old lady from Pasadena. I date myself. But anyway, so she says, you know, would you, and it's like, let me think about it for a minute. Yes. 
So we get a Lexus. I say, are you kidding me? We get a Lexus, you know? And so we had to go at a Honda Civic. What's it worth? About $5,000. We sold our Honda Civic for $5,000, replaced it with a Lexus, and we were able to begin our pledge with a $5,000 gift from selling our car because of a random phone call from an aunt that never before and never since has given us any money. Anyway, so... <laughs> But it was such an amazing blessing. I mean, it was just awesome, you know. And, and it's just, it was just another reminder to me is that you can't outgive God, you know. I mean, some of you have similar kinds of stories where you've trusted God and things, and God has come through in, in, in a way. You know, Dave Ramsey teaches, you know, we're supposed to live like no one else so we can live like no one else. Believe it or not, Dave Ramsey got most of his stuff from Larry Burkett, you know, <laughs> some of the other guys that came before him. But, but it's all valid principles. We've been living our whole life, Gail and I, as a family, based upon those biblical principles. And, and I just want to say that it is, it, it works. God intends for us to live differently, and we have never compromised giving from the first, not from the last, and, and certainly sacrificially as well. When? On the first day of every week, he says it means to give regularly. Now, it's interesting today because, you know, you, like we have the, you know, the, little, the little envelopes, you know, that are there, and, and I kind of almost smile at that now because you pull out those envelopes and all that, and I'm thinking about, you know what, I don't think there's anybody under 40 that even has a checkbook. I'm not sure, but I don't think they do. I know for sure that if you're under 30, you couldn't give me $10 cash today, for sure. You know, so, I mean, it's just, like you know they don't carry cash no checks it's like how do you ex I ask my kids how do you guys just like get along is it like, they look at me like i'm from the stone ages you know i'll just venmo it to you you know it's like okay venmo all right mom's got a venmo right yeah well venmo mom you know it, you know it's just people do stuff differently here's the deal you know the online giving all that is really growing that's what it is you know texting you can text all these other kinds of crazy things that people do the bottom line is that you give in a consistent way, in a regular way, to the place in which you, dis you receive your spiritual food. That's what he's talking about here. You know, for them, for sure. It was, you know, every week, uh, it wasn't always money. It was, it was other things as well, you know, that they came, that they brought in ways of offering, not just uh, a lot of times they didn't have money, you know, in terms of cash as we think of it today. But anyway, it's, it's on a consistent basis. Where the church, that's what he said there. And then how much as you may prosper. Now, here's the deal. As you may prosper and you think, well, I can tell you, the tr I can tell you man, you know, we're not prospering. So we would love to give, but we're not prospering, so we can't give. You know, as you may prosper, as if that's kind of a release from actual giving. So the concept of as you may prosper is not what we think of. See, we're, we're kind of lost in the whole prosperity thing because of the prosperity gospel that is so, so prevalent in the United States of America. And by the way, it seems like the only preachers i've ever seen outside of the united states which i've been quite a bit in some third world countries that are pretty tough are all prosperity preachers you know you turn on the tv and that's all they hear all these prosperity preachers and oh my goodness is this all we're exporting it just is so sad so we're not talking about prosperity like in the like oh man we're blessed with a whole lot of money think of the word vitality as God gives you vitality, what does that mean? That means the ability to make a living and care for your family. If God has given you the ability to get up and physically work so that you can make a living for your family as you prosper, then you need to plan, you need to save, do not spend 100% of everything you make on yourself. That's what the world does. In fact, everybody in the world spends 110%, at least in the United States, of what they make. He says, I don't want you to live like that. The principle of tithing says give to God first. Saving, give, put some away for a rainy day for, for emergencies or somebody who comes up in need for benevolence, those kinds of things. So you have something to share with others and live on the rest. It's usually about 80%, 70 to 80%. Live on that. That's what he means when he talks about prosper. The whole principle of first fruits, you know, uh, is a principle from the Old Testament. You get from the first, not from the last. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Let each one of you must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. In Malachi, 4, uh, Malachi basically God says, Hey man, test me in this, just see. If, if you give to me first, if I don't open the floodgates from heaven. So this is the principle here in terms of, of, of giving. Secondly is the giving of your time. But I will come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I am going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may, so that you may send me uh, on my way 
wherever I might go. Again, remember, Paul's saying, I might come and I might even go back to Jerusalem with the gift that you guys collect. He wasn't sure at this point. Here's verse 7. For I do not wish to see you now just in passing. In other words, if I were just to kind of blow through, that's not my intention. Look what he wants to do. For I hope to remain with you for some time, if the Lord permits. But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wider door of effective service is opened to me. And then he goes on and says, and there are many adversaries. Paul has a great opportunity. He wants to spend more time, he says, in Ephesus until Pentecost. And when he comes, he wants to be able to spend significant amount of time with the Corinthian believers. Here's the thing. Don't just think of what you have as your treasure, but also your time. And for many of you, time is the most precious commodity that you have because you don't have any extra time. You have no margin in your life for anything other than what you're currently doing right now. Listen, God has given you abilities that we're going to talk about in terms of talents in a minute, but one of the things that he's also given you is time. And you have to be willing specifically to invest time in people. And we live in a day and an age when so much works against relationships. In fact, one of the greatest challenges that Gen X is experiencing right now is that literally there are so many substitutes for personal relationships that the most important thing that we can teach them is interpersonal skills to relate to other people. It just is. And so when we talk about those things, uh, you know, we've, um, we, we literally say that until they understand the essence, the, the uh, essential need for other people in their lives, they're not going to be able to prioritize that. And we have to understand that we have to model that. We need to spend time with people is the bottom line. A number of years ago, the elders, we, we said, you know, as a church, you know, what are we trying to do? You know, what's our purpose? Why, why, what are we trying to do? And, and so we came up with this, this slogan, kind of life transformation. We want to see people's lives transformed. And we were, we were doing that for a while. And, they, and then finally somebody said, so, so what does life transformation look like? Oh, that's a good question. And so, you know, we started coming up with a few ideas. And we thought, you know, maybe we ought to get this on paper. You know, maybe we ought to write this down so it's like a little bit more specific. So what does it look like to be transformed in the likeness of Christ? So here's what we said. Here's what we came up with. Quick list. Confess Christ. Follow him in baptism, in obedience. Join the church to be a part of this group of people here. Have a regular devotional time with God in his word. We'd say daily, spend time with God in his word. Engage in meaningful spiritual discussions with your family. Be pointed. Take advantage of the opportunity while your children are in your home to take advantage of those opportunities to have spiritual conversations. Stewardship, giving regularly and generously what we're talking about here today. Number seven, involved in meaningful ministry, which we're also talking about here today. Number eight, involved in a smaller group that encourages accountability and spiritual growth. We need other people in our lives. We need to be a part of a of small group. Actively share your faith. And then number 10, becoming a world Christian. You see, all of these things involve three things, giving your time, your talent, and your treasure if you're going to have any kind of meaningful spiritual development and growth in your life, you've got to understand it's with people. It's being involved with people and looking for opportunities to serve. And when he says in verse 8, I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost for a door of effective service is open to me, he looked and he said, right now God has given me an opportunity with people and I can't pass up. I need to stay engaged here. God gives us wide doors of open opportunity. We have a responsibility to step through them. Every one of us. God will give you a unique opportunity. He'll open a door of opportunity. You need to step through that in giving your time. And then third is giving the talent. Look what he says here. Now if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid. For he's doing the Lord's work. I want you to think about that just for a second. Why would Timothy be afraid? For he's doing the Lord's work. Okay, as also I am. So let no one despise him, but send him on his way in peace, so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brethren. And then he goes on and he talks about Apollos. Why do you think Timothy would have been afraid? 
Well, because he was a very, very young man in ministry. And when Paul wrote Timothy a letter, you know what he said to Timothy? Let not anyone look down upon you for your youthfulness, Timothy, but you prove yourselves to be an example to them in speech and conduct. Even though you're a young man in ministry, you are representing me. I want you to be an example to them. And he's saying to the older Christians in Corinth, listen, leave this young man alone. Allow for him to grow and develop into the man that God is calling him to be. Friends, we believe at a or Bible Church that we are to invest in next generation leaders. And you know, the Apostle Paul, he took his shots, man. I mean, he took his, his criticism he took, you know, from Christians, he took a tremendous amount of that. He took persecution from Jews uh, who hated him as well. He had these Judaizers that beat him up and ran him out of town and left him for dead and all of these other things. He had experienced a lot of pain and suffering as an older man. But one of his great concerns was for the next generation leaders, Timothy, Titus, these younger men that were coming up and friends, uh, and, and wanting to make sure that he protected them for their own development. We have a responsibility as a church to build into the next generation of leaders and to do so in a very, very deliberate way. And here's what our responsibility, those of you who are older, here's what your responsibility is, that you are to be an example of service to God using your three T's because an example speaks louder than words. You want to have an impact for the next generations? Then be an example in service for God. And then secondly, be open to young, new, gifted individuals. Understanding that God is raising up a new generation. It doesn't look like the old generation. They're different. I'm tired. I really am already tired of all of the, the humor that's directed towards millennials and now directed towards Gen X. And I think so many times it's so demeaning. And the fact of the matter is they have a lot to offer. And I think, frankly, there's a failure in leadership on our part as, as older folks to be able to really motivate these people properly. And so we need to own it, you know. And the fact of the matter is, is that these kids have not had good examples. They've not been raised in homes that have taught them these principles. They don't have interpersonal relational skills, you know, because the devices that they're using all the time that are substitutes for that. You know, we need to put some, some boundaries even on those things and give them environments in which they can grow and they can develop. I have learned this from my own father in terms of investing in next generation leaders. There are a number of young men in ministry today who have come from Atascadero Bible Church who are not here at this church but at different locations. And when they come back to town, they'll stop in and see my aged father who's at the Christian home and say hi. You know why? Because... He took them out for lunch or breakfast or coffee or whatever, listened to their story and said, you know what, I believe in you. You can just ask the Zollners. Their two boys were recipients of that. There's a young man that grew up here, Jason Sobolski, who grew up here in our church too. And, you know, whenever he gets a chance, he'll say, say hi to Charlie, you know, for me. If I see him or talk to him or anything else, they'll always mention his name because he was an older man who invested in younger men who believed in them and they are recipients of a great blessing. Listen, what are you doing to bless the younger generation of believers? I know there's some great challenges, you know, there's change, there always is change and change is happening quickly and it often has to do with music and other things and I, and I get that. But I'll tell you what, man, one of the most important things that we can do as older believers who are more mature in the faith is to invest deliberately in the next generation leaders. I want to show you a picture. When you hear the word church leadership project, I want to give you an idea what, who these kids are. These are some of them. It's not all of them. I know it's kind of a goofy looking group, but it's the best we got, okay? So these are the ones that live across the street in our in our housing that we have in the apartments across the street and a lot of you who've worked on crew and other things have really helped to make that become a reality thank you for that but uh, we believe that you know a live-in mentoring program is what's necessary today to kind of undo some of the stuff that's going on 
Uh, you know, just simply meeting together isn't enough. It's discipleship. It's intentional. It's getting them out of the environment. It's putting on some restrictions artificially to help them and, and all those other kinds of things. Uh, the church leadership project. Um, here's something else that you haven't heard about, but that's a part of what we are planning as well. It's called the ABC Studios. And I want you, okay, keep an open mind because there's often a very negative disposition as it relates to some of the things that we're talking about here. So keep an open mind. L look at the ABC Studios. At ABC, we believe in equipping the next generation of leaders for the church. And we believe the church ought to be on the leading edge of creativity, the arts, and technology. As we prepare our students to influence their community and culture, we need to hand them tools, creative tools, progressive tools that will inspire creativity and foster innovation. Introducing ABC Studios. We plan to renovate a 1,400 square foot building on campus into what we will call ABC Studios. This space will house an advanced film production studio, including an industry standard cinema camera, green screen, sound stage, and two production workstations. Adjacent to the film wing will be a digital music and recording studio equipped with three workstations for music production, editing, and mixing. The space will be strategically set up for hands-on learning and training with industry-leading tools of the trade. Together, we will cultivate arts in the church and disciple the next generation of kingdom creatives. Why did I say keep an open mind? You know, it's interesting because I've talked about this. We've talked about this with a few people, and I've, I, we've literally had somebody say to us, you know, don't they have enough stuff already? Do they really need something more? It looks like just more toys for them to play with. And I thought, you know, um, obviously they don't understand that the generation in which we live today, one of the great challenges. So, so let's talk about our mission strategy. Our, our missions initiatives, for example. Okay, for some of you who are newer, you may not know what, what they are, but what we're strategically attempting to do is plant churches in the least reached places in the world. Two to three percent of all giving towards missions goes to places that are already reached with the gospel. The 2.5 billion people that have yet been to be reached and have never heard about Jesus one time well, less than 3% of giving today is directed towards those people. Those are the people we want to invest in, okay? But here's the challenge. You can't go there on a short-term missions trip. We can't send a bunch of white people over there to go over there, Westerners, to go into a Muslim culture and show up and stuff and, and relate with the church planters and then come back home to tell the stories about how amazing it is because all we will do is jeopardize their lives and we'll nullify any ability they have to be effective. So how, what do you do? What the challenge is, is that people today give emotionally, primarily. And, if you, and, and, and everybody knows this out there, that if you want people to give, then what you need to do is show a picture of an orphan. Or you need to talk about other things that are very important issues, trafficking, other things that are very important issues today. You know, and and, and, and you, you get the emotional plea out there, and people will respond emotionally we as a church are saying no, so we're going to go after the toughest thing to do church planting to the toughest place in the whole world and we're not going to be able to go there ourselves there is no motion, emotional attachment that any of you feel with that at this moment now some of you are strategic givers say hey it's brilliant man i get it man i i'm all in you know but most people don't react that way here's what we're saying to our young people, to the next generation. Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, it's all about telling your story. Here's what we want you to do. We want you to tell their story, not your story. We want you to tell his story, not your story. And the only way that we're going to be able to communicate what we need to communicate is if we have gifted people that take what they have and what they've learned to capture other people's stories to come back and share it with all of us 
so that we can, can, we can be moved. Because honestly, we want to know what's going on. If I'm given, I want to make sure it's legit. I wanna, who are these people that we're talking about? For example, we're talking about moving into the inner city with a house in Oakland, a transition house where guys are being trained in San Quentin prison theologically with a thing called Tumi to be able to plant churches in the inner city. We are now partnering. A few weeks ago, I shared with you the video from Bernard. Okay, I took that video on my, my iPhone 5, which no longer is working. But anyway, so it's a personal problem. But it, it was not a very good video. And, and let me show you an example now of another poor quality video from James, the first guy that's going to move into the house in Oakland that's going to be our first church planter who is from Oakland. It's exciting. It's probably good enough, but these are the stories that we want to capture for our congregation and for others. Let's listen to James, the first of the inhabitants of that house in Oakland. Let's hear his story. All right, my name is James Allen. Um, recently paroled from San Quentin Prison. Uh, after doing 24 years of life under three strikes, uh, one of the most amazing things that happened in my life in, during my period of incarceration has been uh, the Toomey program, the Urban Ministry Institute. Uh, it changed my walk from being uh, religious to being in relationship with God. And this program has helped me to see that I can contribute to society in a, uh, in a major way. Um, coming back out and being able to come to a transitional home, a leadership transitional home that um, will help me to impact the community in a positive way is an awesome thing for the way I used to be because I was, I was an outlaw, I was a criminal and I took. And um, I didn't realize how much it impacted not only my community but my family. So with that said, this opportunity to be in a leadership home, training home, is awesome to me. Um, now my goal is to finish well, to hear when God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. So anybody that helps this cause will be helping that cause. It's, it's a kingdom cause. Praise God. So we're super excited about this. This is a prototype. This is something that you would think would be done all over the nation. Today it's not. Not that we can, that we've been able to find this. So we are partnering with another church, Tapestry Church there in Oakland, to do this leadership project almost like across the street only with guys that are released citizens from the institutions and the incarcerated and to begin a church plant in the inner cities. The only hope for the inner city is Jesus. And these are the guys to do it. They really are. And so this is something that we're investing in intentionally a a as a result of that. And, uh, and, and we're praying that, that this would catch fire, that suburban churches would be able to partner with urban churches and church planning and those kinds of things. But these guys need a place to land. And, you know, and, and they need some resourcing during the year to be able to kind of keep the lights on and keep food in the cupboards and those kinds of things while they're getting their feet on the ground, getting the job, and beginning to church plant among the people that they came from and, and the places that they came from. Friends, this giving experience these next 60 days, what we're just simply saying is this. Ask God. Ask God where you are to invest your time, talent, and treasure over the next 60 days. Seek God in this. Maybe it's the GoFund. We had somebody see the film, you know, the video a few weeks ago and donated $2,000. We're trying to raise $10,000 to furnish that 1717 10th Street house in Oakland so that they have a place that they can sit around a table and they can, they can you know, have beds to sleep and those kinds of things. Uh, maybe that would be something you'd be interested in. Maybe it's our church leadership project, ABC Studios. I had a guy afterwards from Orange County that, that literally came up after the service and said, hey, this is right up my alley. I'd like to help, you know, and, and all. He's got the technical experience and those kinds of things. Uh, you know, maybe this weekend you'd say, I'll come to Awaken, and Saturday night I'll stay here late to help tear down because we're going to have church the next day after Awaken, and it's a bunch of stuff that needs to be ta taken down maybe you can bake cookies before you know to be a part of that maybe it's a caring angel tree we need names of people of families in need 
but we're also going to need a lot of help as uh, that, that grows every year for Christmas as we get gifts for people that have a real need. Thanksgiving dinner, you know, we serve a Thanksgiving dinner and we've got a lot of families already that are involved, but maybe you'd like to be involved in helping just to serve uh, the poor and, and that Thanksgiving dinner that we have on Thanksgiving Day. Our benevolence fund, maybe during this time of year, you know that there are families with some needs that come up. We get people with requests all the time the money given to benevolence allows for us to help those families. And the GoFund, what we've been talking about is these strategic initiatives that we have to take the gospel to the hardest places. We have a portfolio that's really clear. It's a folder that you can look at. It's very, very self-explanatory. I think it's worthy of your investment. Would you, t- would you pray and ask God, what can I do with my three T's? What kind of investment can I make in the lives of other people? When am I going to take the advantage of the wide open door of opportunity that God's given me and step through it? Because at the end of the day, your labor, your toil, it will not be in vain. Anything that you invest for the Lord. God says, you know, store up for yourself treasures in heaven and not here on this earth. The world says, consume everything you got for yourself. Live for yourself. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time together and our opportunity to even talk about what it means to live a life of giving and how we find joy and fulfillment in our lives when we do so, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil is not in vain. And I'm grateful, God, for everything you've given us, our salvation, our hope, the hope of heaven, our future, all of these things. But God, for now, we're not just here to kick back until that day comes. We have things that you've called us uniquely to do. Lord, I pray that we might accept the challenge, step forward, and Lord, just see what you might do through us as we take you seriously. Let each one consider. Lord, I pray that might be true of every person here today. It's in Jesus' name. Pray. Amen.
of death. This is the power of Christ in me. My first cry, final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of In the power of Christ, we stand. God has an amazing plan for every single one of us. Don't believe the lie. You know, the lie is is that I don't have much to offer. And, you know, and uh, so many other people have so much more than me. God has uniquely designed every single one of us for His glory, for His purpose. There's a wide open door of ministry opportunity if we'll just look and uh, see what God. So we challenge you for the next 60 days to really make that a point of prayer. Thanks for being here. God bless you. We'll see you next week.